it is great to be back. I'm really happy to be here today and to have this opportunity. So before we get started with frogs and lizards, uh, I have a question. How many of you know anything about Puerto Rico? It's universe. <laughs> I'm surprised no one said Despacito. Yeah. I actually, where were we were in the store a couple days ago, and I was so happy to be back here in the Philippines, and then I heard over the radio I heard that familiar song, Despacito. <laughs> There's actually a lot of shared history between the Philippines and Puerto Rico. Does anyone know where Puerto Rico is? No. Okay, we'll get to all that. Don't worry. So don't worry, we will get to all that. If I can figure out how to use my computer. Okay. So, it's not how I Okay. I think I got this. So, basically both Puerto Rico and the Philippines were previously both Spanish and American colonies. The difference is you guys got independence. Puerto Rico is one of five colonies that the United States still has. We don't call them colonies because no one likes, so you know, there are lots of politically correct terms like uh, unincorporated territory, which is different than a colony because of the spelling. Um, you guys are a significantly larger area, but, and you have a larger population, but we are actually more densely populated. Only slightly, but uh, yeah, so there's a significant shared history. Now, I got my start in Puerto Rico in 2008, and I moved to a sustainable forestry project, oh, thank you, uh, called Las Casas de la Selva, and basically I sold all of my stuff. I didn't want to, I wanted to live in the tropics, and I wanted to study herpetology, and I was studying environmental consulting, which has absolutely nothing to do with helping the environment. So I basically moved to Puerto Rico, started doing herpetological surveys in uh, this valley. We used uh, volunteers from all over the world who would come and volunteer with us. That's me teaching some students how to do uh, chytrid sampling. Chytrid is a disease, a fungal disease that uh, can infect amphibians. And so we were testing for it. We'll talk more about these guys. These are the anolis lizards that I'm currently studying. And that's me when I back, back when I thought long hair was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> now, as Dr. Fong said, I then, OK, there we go. So then I came here. Honestly, I shaved all that hair off two weeks before moving to the Philippines for a year in uh, this. I was packing, I was getting ready to go, and I looked in the mirror one day, and just all that hair looked like Medusa, and I thought, well, if I'm not taking care of it now, you know, I probably won't have time, so I shit. And it's a good look, I think. I think it's been better. So this was our project in the portorium. A couple of the frogs we got to work with. Let's see, can I remember? Let's see, Platymantis luzonensis, Maracophorus pardalis, and then uh, I was here as a Fulbright scholar, so that's just a little photo uh, at the end of my stay. So I am studying, I don't know, have you guys heard of the hurricane that hit? Well, you guys, so, Hurricane Maria on September 20th. Uh, it was the most damaging hurricane in the history of Puerto Rico. And you will see some of the damage shortly. So I am studying the herpetofauna of one of the forests. But before we get into that, so that tiny little island right there in the Caribbean is Puerto Rico. I'm converting miles to kilometers in my head, because uh, I'm still thinking miles. It's about 160 kilometers long by about 60, 65 kilometers wide, give or take. Not a big island. But we have one tiny mountain range and then one fairly extensive, you can see it's a tiny island, but very mountainous. Um, and because of that, we, as I already pointed out, have a pretty you know, big population density because we end up with a lot of land that you can actually inhabit. Have you guys heard of the Holdridge Life Zone system? So generally speaking, it's a general way of classifying ecosystems. And basically, all you need to know from this is that, with the exception of the southwest coast, most of Puerto Rico is some form 
of either subtropical moist wet or rainforest. So it is a heavily forested island, or was. Um, and it wasn't always like that. Puerto Rico is one of the most successful examples of reforestation in the world. Around 1910, 7% forest cover because the Spanish and the Americans pretty much cut everything down. And uh, there were reforestation efforts. There, were all, there was also economic development and incentives to get people to stop, uh, to stop farming, basically, and move to the cities. And so when you leave fields fallow, what happens? Ecological succession. So now we're roughly at about 65% forest cover. Whole dridge life zone is somewhat simplistic. So recently, some professors at UPR, at University of Puerto Rico, along with uh, other partnering universities in the United States, use GIS as well as soil information and uh, plant community information to identify really intricate uh, ecosystem uh, kind of what do you want, classification. And they identified 25 different ecosystems on our tiny little island. Now one thing to keep in mind about Puerto Rico, all of the red on that map is urban areas. So lots of forest, lots of cities. Not so much agriculture. We import 85% of our food. And that really hurt during the hurricane. But we'll get that to that in a minute. Because we are talking about lizards and frogs. So in the Caribbean, the most common lizard you are going to find are the anoles, genus anolis. And they have 361 species in the genus. They used to have over 400, and then taxonomists kind of divvied it up. But I don't know if this is still the case. Back when there were over 400, it was the largest ambiote genus on Earth. So ambiote, any organism with amniotic fluid. Um, the important thing for my study is that in the Caribbean islands, as you can see here, anoles almost always evolve to fit one of six habitat types. Mm -hmm. On every, whether it's Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, you put a colonizing species on the island, come back <coughs> millions of years, and you have <laughs> species that have evolved to fit these different. Mm -hmm. So we have one, pretty much every island has a bit, one big species that kind of monopolizes the canopy. Then you have species that use the upper levels of the trunk and some of the canopy. You have really weird ones called twig anoles. Most species have prehensile tails to actually help them pull them to the very tips. You have species that live on just the trunk, and then you have trunk ground species, pretty obvious. And then you have grass and bush anoles that actually don't usually live in forest, and they prefer uh, open habitat. And to give you some examples, so this is what anoles look like. And here you can see, this, these are examples of, canna, of the crown giant anoles, the big anoles. This one is Anolis cuvieri from Puerto Rico. This one is Anolis garmani from Jamaica. They look very similar. They use similar habitats. They are not at all closely related. Uh, I'll, Dr. Jonathan Losos of Harvard, as well as many other scientists, have done a lot of genetic work all the anoles on a particular island are much more close, closely related to each other than they are to their ecomorphs. So aside from the fact that these guys just look really cool, why do we even care about all these little lizards? Well, not only are they cool looking, and not only have they kind of evolved to inhabit every possible niche in the forest, but Caribbean islands are sort of the direct opposite. Uh, I mean, the Philippines is so biodiverse. Mm -hmm. But we are very species poor mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. compared, it's nothing compared to the Philippines. But every species is pretty high in abundance. There are anoles everywhere. You, you, it's a great place to be a lazy herpetologist. You don't have to, I mean, when we were out looking for frogs, we were, where are they? And if you're looking for an old, you just have to walk down the street. And it's really wonderful. But that actually has ecological value for us. 
In the diurnal food web of Puerto Rican forests, anoles are the most commonly encountered vertebrate, which means they eat a lot of things, and it means they get eaten by a lot of things. So if anything messes with their population, it's going to mess with the entire food web. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce you to some of our anoles specifically in Puerto Rico. So there's Anolus cuvieri, that big one that I told you about before. And this one is Anolus stratulus. And this, and Evermani, we have two species of trunk crowns. So the smaller ones that use the top of the trunks as well as some of the lower canopy. They can't go too far from the canopy because they have this guy to deal with. And anoles are very territorial. They don't like, males don't like anyone but females of their own species. They don't like males of their own species. They don't like anoles of other species. Um, so they fight constantly. It's a really interesting thing to watch. I once saw five male anolus gunlachi. It was like a little anole street fight. They all just, you know, on one tree, they just all wanted that tree for whatever reason is their territory. So anolus gunlachi is our trunk ground species. They will live maybe a little higher up in the ceiling on a tree and then down and utilize maybe a meter or two of the ground of whatever tree they're inhabiting. And anolus krugi is one of our grass bush anole species. These are the target anoles in my study, uh, which we will get to in just a moment. And to kind of put that visually, that diagram I showed you, so this is where they all live in the tree and the ground and in the forest ecosystem. So th that's the diurnal food web. But the nocturnal food web, did Dr. Burroughs play the pokey sound for everyone? No. I'll have to see if I have. So Puerto Rico is known for a little tree frog, mm -hmm. a tiny little tree frog that's very loud, Eleutherodactylus koki. Now Eleutherodactylus uh, is all over the New World, 185 species. Eleutherodactylus free toed, most of them do not have webbing between their toes. And just like your genus Platymantis, they have direct development mm -hmm. and some form of parental care. In Puerto Rico, it, tend, it seems to be, it's, uh, for every species, it's the males that tend to the eggs. The female lays the eggs. Um, a relative of the koki in Puerto Rico, Eleutherodactylus koki, which is this one, the record was they found a male that was uh, guarding five clutches of eggs, one from a different female. It seems to be, it's very common for males to have multiple clutches from different females because obviously, as far as uh, reproductive success goes, well, if you're capable of taking care of one clutch of eggs, that makes you more attractive to a female because you'll probably take care of her eggs too. So this little frog, the Luthrodactylus koki, is so common that there have been estimations in certain areas of just perfect forest conditions for it of 20,000 per hectare. So, Lots of frogs, and they are very loud. They are called koki because their mating call is exactly that. Koki, koki, only. I'm not doing it nearly as loud. <laughs> their, their call goes off at 100 decibels, which I have been told is the same level of noise as when a chainsaw, when you rub a chainsaw, that level of noise. They are loud. They are very loud. I sleep with earplugs all the time in Puerto Rico. I love the quiet nights here. Um, relatives are this one. This is called the Koki Wahong, and it is a habitat specialist that lives in rock caves next to rivers. Mm -hmm. And then Eleutherodactylus richmondi. This is a terrestrial Koki that uh, is actually critically endangered. Mm -hmm. But so far in my study, I've only really encountered the common Koki. Now, getting to what I'm actually studying, that's Puerto Rico. And that's Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria hit us. It started a little bit in the early hours of September 20th. This was the most damaging hurricane in the history of Puerto Rico. Um, we still don't have, so it's been seven months, we still don't have electricity back on the entire island. It wiped out everything. This is a, a aerial view of flooding. The floodwaters didn't recede until almost a week later. 
you can see here's the path of the, of the eye of the storm, although everything got hit. And the light blue along the entire coast and even in some of the valleys inland, that's all flooding that happened as a result of the, of the uh, hurricane. And in regards to the forest, you can kind of see, so this is uh, satellite imagery of September 17th, and then four days after the hurricane. Every tree on the island was pretty much defoliated, and there, it's all an estimate, but somewhere between 22 million and 31 million trees were killed. There, it was, it's been quite a few. As far as estimated rainfall, yeah. right here, that project that I told you I worked at, they got the most, right, 40 inches of rain, which is, what, 40 times 2.5, so 100 centimeters of rain in the course of several hours. And it's, it had a, quite an impact, so this is, I took these photos, Remember how I told you Puerto Rico imports 85% of its food? That's a bit of a problem when there's a natural disaster. This was still three weeks after the hurricane. You would have to wait in line, and they would let about 10 or 20 people into the grocery store at a time. This is what your selection was. You know, there were still some canned goods left. They would have, there were uh, limits on the amount of water you were allowed to buy. I put this, so this is humorous, this is at a gas station I stopped at, and you'll notice everything is empty except for, have you guys ever heard, you have monster energy drink here? Yes. Yeah, so we're starving, but we don't care, no one's going to drink that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was literally the only thing in those cases still there. The forest, so at the project where I worked at in Patias, this is, you know, this is common in the Caribbean with a hurricane. A lot of the trees have adapted so that they lose all their branches because it does, you can regrow your branches. It does no good if you get toppled over in a hurricane. So basically the entire island looked like toothpicks. You can see some of the damage. And just all of that, that's supposed to be a road. That's actually bamboo that collapsed over the road. That one little pine tree managed to keep some of its foliage. So it was devastating. And that brings me to what I'm doing now for my thesis, because I had to change my thesis topic. I was actually going to originally be studying turtles. And after the hurricane, pretty much everyone picked something dealing with the hurricane for their thesis topic. So my advisor works here, the OUK National Forest. And he proposed that we study what this hurricane did to the anoles and the frogs of the forest. Because hurricanes are actually the limiting factor for forests in the Caribbean. We have many of the same species that you'll find in the Amazon, but you see those pictures where there's you know eight people around a huge tree and it takes all of them linking hands to get trees won't get that big. They can't. A hurricane will knock them over. So the hurricanes are the number one factor that affect the structure of forests in Puerto Rico. We have some preliminary data, because in 89, Hugo hit, and it was a category three. And then in, uh, oh, it's supposed to be 98, sorry, Georgia's hit, and it was a strong storm, but it very quickly downgraded to a category two. Category five is the worst for hurricanes. And then Maria was a category four, but here's the funny thing, it was a category four when everything broke. In other words, all of the, it was probably a category five storm, but it broke all of the measuring instruments when it was a category four storm. <laughs> so officially it has to be listed as a category four. So what happened? Well, there's OUP National Forest quote. So hurricanes will impact every aspect of a forest ecosystem, but the number one thing they do is they take all that organic matter that's up in the canopy, and they very conveniently put it down on the forest floor. So it affects the nutrient cycle, it affects uh, the timing, the cycling of everything, fruit production on trees, it messes with the entire food web. Uh, and here's an example. So Hugo um, caused a decrease in fruit-eating birds. 
but an increase in insect eating birds. Because with all of that kind of muck on the forest floor after the hurricane, that was great breeding ground for insects. So there was a lot of food for insect eating birds. So not every species does badly during a hurricane. Some of them do quite well. Same thing with bats, with Hurricane George's. Uh, our fruit eating bats declined more than insect eating bats. Now, in regards to the anoles and frogs that I'm studying, previous studies showed that uh, basically what happens is I showed you all of the anoles have their own little area in the forest that they live in, but when there's no canopy, the canopy anoles can't live there. So everything is laterally compressed. All the anoles are down in understory level, competing with each other for what's, whatever space is available. And that was shown in 1991 after Hurricane Hugo. Um, but Cokies, the juveniles did quite poorly. After Hurricane Hugo, there was a massive die-off of juveniles. But those that made it to adults one year after Hugo did much better because all of that uh, debris on the forest floor made for great breeding sites. So after Hugo, it was really hard to be a baby cookie, but if you managed to make it to adulthood, you were set because there were lots of places for you to breed and you know raise your eggs. And then there was a canopy trimming experiment at El Verde. Uh, this was before my time. They wanted to mimic those two big changes of a hurricane, removal of canopy, and depositing of debris on the forest floor. And they studied what happened to the cookies, what happened to the frogs. And there were four different types of plots. One, the control, and nothing they did nothing to those plots. Two, they cut the canopy out, and they deposited all the debris on the floor, just like a hurricane. Then the third type of plot, they cut the canopy, but they didn't deposit the debris, because they wanted to study just what the lack of canopy did. And they took that debris and put it in the fourth plot, which had debris added, but no canopy opening. So that way they could study those two factors independently. Nature is kind of funny because they were expecting, they thought, well, anywhere that there is added debris, we're going to see an increase in cookies because of what was observed after Hugo. But there's actually a decrease in cookies in the plots that had the canopy removed and the debris added. Can anyone guess why? In all fairness, the people who designed the study didn't think of it. Because a hurricane destroys the entire forest. These are tiny little plots. The cookies just said, oh, open canopy, and they just moved 30 meters away to where it was still pristine forest, and they had their you know, covered canopies. So that was really kind of a funny, a funny little uh, finding of that study. We can skip. So what I'm doing here, I'm kind of recreating previous work, but studying a hurricane that is, has been far more devastating than previous ones. So like I said, there's my study site. And there's the Alberti research area. And within that area, there are all of these plots that are 20 by 20 meters. And then there are 20 meter transects in between them. And essentially, you guys have already done transects. Right, so yeah. I don't have to spend too much time. Walking, I'm basically walking in the mornings and counting anoles, walking in the evenings and counting cookies. I replicate each plot three times per season, and we basically add that and then divide by three to get an average, because we're not clipping, we're not doing you know, full-on clip uh, mark and recapture population. So it's really just kind of a estimation. And then on top of that, so for each one, I just species, age, male or female, what I find them on, and then I'm also, for the anoles, because of that lateral compression, I'm seeing how far I find them, or how high I find them, sorry. Uh, and then, of course, I'm just taking the data and I'm looking at descriptive statistics, analysis of variance to kind of see if there's going to be a difference between the, the different plots, because I have six plots in my study, and then over time. So I have pre-hurricane data, and then I went out and counted in December at three months post-hurricane, 
Right before this trip, I counted the six months post hurricane, and then when I go back in June, I will count nine months post hurricane, and then I will defend and be done with my. <laughs> <laughs> and I can skip over anticipated findings because they're wrong, and I don't want to be wrong. Uh, actually, I'll tell you, I was basically thinking I'm going to find pretty much what I found, or what uh, previous people found. So this is the canopy of the forest three months after the hurricane. Before the hurricane, that was closed canopy. So even three months later, it's still very open. And you can see three months post-hurricane, some greenery is coming back, but uh, still a long ways to go. Remember that fat green Anolis cuviary that I showed you before? It looks a little skinny, doesn't it? I don't know if you guys can see, but those are ribs that you can see poking out. And you can see some of its facial bones. I came across... How big that is? Oh, that one? So that's the giant anole, and they, tip to tail, they're about like this. Half meter. Yeah. And uh, very mean. They don't like it. So remember, this is the one that lives up in the canopy. And I've, I found these guys at eye level. There was this one, and I knew it was the same one because it had a scar on its head. And the poor thing, it, we always found it on this bush that was way too frail for it. And so it was hanging on, and the bush was just bending. And it would, and it would hug it tight trying to hide. But I'm just a leaf. So occasionally you do find an anole who's really winning. Like, that's an Anolis Minaki that's really fat and happy, and whatever he's doing, he's winning in post-hurricane Puerto Rican parts. But here's another one, and you see kind of, let me see if I can, sort of this ridge and this diamond shape, and those are the skull bones. So that poor guy was really starving. He was very easy to catch. And that's not a part of my study, but that would be a really cool thing, is, you know, body weight and exactly... Yeah. It looks like some of these guys are just outright starving to death, yeah. which is interesting because there are, again, post-hurricane, there are lots of insects. So it seems more like there's just so many anoles competing with each other because, again, they're all pressed down. And I'll show you that in graph form in just a moment. So in some of my plots, this was, some of this was really interesting because previously, so the orange is abundance of Anolis Milwaukee. Those are the trunk ground anoles. When Hugo hit, they were almost non-existent because trunk ground anoles love shade. And there's no shade. And this was actually a stronger hurricane. But I have more Milwaukee in my plots than after Hugo. And I haven't figured that out yet. I'm currently in the process of collecting all sorts of data, uh, canopy cover, um, habitat structure, in other words, literally I'm going through every five meters with a pole and measuring where do leaves and branches hit that pole at what height and analyzing all that. Hopefully I can find out why I actually have more anolis. I mean, good for them, they survive, I'm not happy about that, but it is an unexpected finding that they're managing to do so well. Stratolus, those little gray ones that are one of the canopy species, they're still very common. So again, they've come down out of the now non-existent canopy, and they seem to be the most successful. The green ones, Evermani, they're kind of holding their own, but not nearly as much as the Stratolus. So if you can visualize in your mind, basically the canopy species have come down, and the ones that live on the trunk and the ground have been pushed down even further. And this is essentially the same thing in some of my other plots, although in those, the stratolus, those gray ones, have done even better. And you can see this is three months post Maria, this is six months post Maria, so those canopy anoles are still six months after the hurricane uh, at the understory level. And here's, yeah, so pretty much same thing. And here's, here is that height in visual. So Evermani, the green ones, in December, they're at about a meter and a half. So, I mean, we're talking canopy anoles that are just right here. They have started moving back up in March. The average height was around three meters. Stratolus, they're still really low. Now, that's another canopy species, and they're both, both at uh, three and six months post-hurricane. They're still at about a meter and a half. And then poor Gunlocky, the ones that are naturally kind of on the trunk and on the ground, 
less than a meter in height is where I'm finding them, because the other anoles are just kind of pushing them out of their natural habitat. And here's just a different plot, and you can see. Now here, the stratolists are moving up just a bit more. B2, B2 actually didn't have as much damage as some of the other plots, so there's probably more habitat for them. But again, good lucky, less than a meter is where you're fi I'm finding those little brown anoles. And then this is just kind of, for the koki, those little frogs. In four of my plots, that's the average number of koki, so 25, 22, 58, 41. This was pre-hurricane. This was December of 2016. And then in December of 2017, you see we have declines. And then it, that, oh, sorry, that's supposed to be March. So this was just before I flooded. Yet more declines. And that visually, you can see, is like this. So our koki populations are declining. Again, another thing that's the opposite of what was found after Hugo. Anyone want to take a guess? It's indirectly related to the hurricane, but not temperature and humidity. A lot of times, some well, not always, but sometimes, as happened with us after a hurricane, there's a drought. Interestingly enough, after Hugo, that drought was immediate. So when they got out and did the study, it had passed the drought time. And I guess they have recovered. What I think is that, you know, the drought actually started, so that's December. It started around January was when it started getting really dry. And I mean really dry. We didn't have hardly any rain from January. From January until the day I got on the plane to come here, I think it rained four times, which is unheard of, even in the dry season for Puerto Rico, and especially at El Yunque Forest which is normally the wettest forest on the island. We can skip over the literature cited. And I thank my committee. And LTER is the Long-Term Ecological Research. Basically, I'm at that stage in graduate school where I get to get younger people and make them go out and count the gnolls with me, uh, whether they want to or not, which is very helpful. PR, LSA, and P is my fellowship. They paid for me to come here, so I thank them very much. And of course, I have to thank the faculty at UBLB and here at the museum. It's been absolutely wonderful to have this chance to come back and talk to you guys. And I hope you learned a little something from this presentation in spite of our technical difficulties. And uh, I hope this makes you want to come see Puerto Rico. <laughs> Once we get electricity back, wait a little while longer. It'll be a lot nicer if you wait till maybe next year. Unless we get another hurricane, and then my thesis project might change yet again. Uh -huh. It'll be titled, Is There Anything Left in the Forest? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys.